I want to start this morning with a question. How many of you here this morning would admit that you struggle with doubts regarding your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't need to raise your hand. But I wonder how many of you are here on this Easter Sunday morning, a day infused with hope because of Jesus' victory over the grave, and yet if you're honest, you wrestle with all types of of doubts. Maybe you struggle like I have at times with intellectual doubts about Christianity. Questions like, is the scripture really the word of God? What about the problem of evil and human suffering? Did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead on the third day? On that last question, friends, you realize, don't you, that the disciples of Jesus themselves struggled with doubts after they found the tomb empty on that first resurrection morning. Despite Jesus' repeated predictions in the weeks leading up to the cross that he would not only die but rise again, friends, not a single one of the disciples responded like this when they discovered that Jesus' body was no longer in the grave. Aha! Oh yeah, the third day. Happy Easter, everyone. No, not at all. They responded exactly like we would have. They were dumbstruck and terrified. And yet, something happened in the days and weeks following the empty tomb that that pulled the disciples out of the hiding places where they had fled in despair after Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion. Something compelled them to start publicly insisting at the risk of their own lives that Jesus of Nazareth was alive. When the onslaught of suffering came, something propelled them to preach that good news all the more boldly, to rejoice that they had been counted worthy to suffer reproach for the sake of Jesus' name. Friends, what happened to quell the disciples' doubts and give them such boldness? They saw the risen Christ with their own eyes. You know what encourages me about all of that? When Jesus appeared to all the disciples after his resurrection, He didn't chide them or shame them for their weak faith. He certainly didn't cancel them for not being more perceptive. He literally invited them to touch his nail-scarred hands and his spear-pierced side. He walked with them and talked with them and explained the scripture to them and ate real food with them. What did Jesus do to calm their doubts? He gave them himself. Friends, did you realize that Jesus approaches you, doubting believer, with the same type of tenderness even this morning? Whether you have intellectual doubt today about Christianity or perhaps an emotional doubt about the assurance of your salvation, friends, I have good news for you this morning. Our Lord's M.O., (laughs) his way is not to lecture you or to condemn you. Instead, our Lord wants to come alongside you and assure your heart this morning with the glorious truths of his eternal love. That because of what Jesus has done, you and I can be confident that we are forever safe and secure in the arms of God. Friends, this is the message of our passage today in Romans chapter 8. So I invite you to open your Bibles and turn to Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 8. Friends, if you didn't make it to church with a Bible this morning. There are black Bibles in the seats in front of you. Take that Bible out. Turn it to page 888, Romans chapter 8. Coincidentally, page 888, that's where we're going to be this morning. Friends, if you don't happen to own a Bible, please take that home. The Bible is now yours. Read from it this week. If you're new with us at Redeeming Grace Church, just know that this is actually not a special Easter sermon that I'm giving this morning. It is simply the next sermon in our series in Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, since Romans 8.34 explicitly mentions the resurrection of Jesus, I figured that, well, that was enough Easter material not to deviate from our normal series. So I'm thankful for the way the Lord providentially lined that up for us uh, this morning. But since we're in the middle of an ongoing series, let me give you a bit of a running start, okay, into our text this morning here at the end of Romans 8. Friends, this book of the Bible that we call Romans is actually an ancient letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Rome around A.D. 57. 
He wrote so that the Jewish and Gentile believers in the churches in Rome might be might better understand all that Christ had done for them and so be unified together in those churches around Christ and his gospel. And here in chapter 8, it's, it's like Paul soars to the heights of the Himalayas of God's grace as he surveys one by one all the amazing benefits Christ Jesus has won for us in our salvation. Now that we've made it to the end of Romans 8, it's kind of like we've reached the summit of Mount Everest. These last nine verses, Romans 8, 31 to 39, are an electrifying grand finale to all that he has written in chapter 8, and really all that he's written about our salvation through Christ in the letter so far. Friends, this passage, this passage is one of the most encouraging passages in the entire Bible. It is meant to assure us struggling, doubting Christians of the certainty of our hope through Jesus Christ. Let's take up the scripture and read it together this morning. Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the first thing you notice about this passage is that it is structured around five massive questions that Paul asks. Did you see those questions in verse, verses 31 to 35? Clearly, Paul assumes that the answer to these questions are obvious. Each question is so penetrating that it winds up having the force of a promise. So, for instance, look at, look at the first question in verse 31, which I actually think is Paul's thesis for the whole thing. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, friends, that that question has such an obvious answer that it winds up assuring us of the promise of the Lord's protection, that if God is for us through Christ, no opponent can succeed against us. It's a question with a force of a promise. That's how each of the questions in verses 31 to 35 work. And what I think is happening is that Paul's questions In verses 32 to 35, those next four questions are the proofs that his question in verse 31, the force of the promise in verse 31, is in fact true. How can we know that God is for us, that no opponent can be successful against us? Well, here are the proofs. Verse 32, God will graciously give us all things. Verse 33, no one will successfully bring a charge against God's elect. Verse 34, no one can condemn us before God. Verse 35, nothing will separate us from God's love. See how that works? Friends, in our time together this morning, I simply want us to consider these five promises of God to his people that are implied by the penetrating questions that Paul asks. What are those promises? Here's here's the outline of the sermon this morning. Number one, no opposition. We see that in verse 31 no opposition. Number two, no deprivation. We see that in verse 32. Number three, no condemnation. We see those in the questions Paul asks in verses 33 and 34. No condemnation. Number four, no separation. No opposition, no deprivation, no condemnation, no separation. It's simply impossible. So friends, it's easy to see the main idea once you grasp kind of what Paul is doing in this passage. The main idea of this text that is going to drive the sermon this morning is this. Christian, 
Nothing in the universe can thwart your salvation. Amen? Christian, nothing in the entire universe, not opposition, not deprivation, not condemnation, and not separation, nothing in the entire cosmos can thwart your salvation if you're in Christ. Brother or sister, if you're struggling this morning with doubts and fears about your standing before God, I pray this passage would be like concrete that fixes you firmly in the reality that God's love for you in Christ indeed cannot change. Because Paul's clear aim for this passage is that the believers in Rome would think with him about all that God has done to save them and then apply that gospel theology to their daily lives and to their ongoing struggles. And so what the Holy Spirit wants to do among us today is simply that same thing. It's as if the Spirit of God is saying to you, precious brother and sister, think, think, Christian brother or sister, struggling with cares and fears and suffering and sin, think. What shall we say then to these things? Think about all that Paul has written in Romans so far about what God has done in Christ to save you from your sin. Think about what I just told you in verses 28 to 30, that that God is work in every every detail of your life, including your darkest suffering to bring you into eternal glory. Think about what all this means for you. Stop with the emotional thinking and the inaccurate thinking about your situation and get a grip on all that Christ has done for you. Look at what God has promised you through the work of his son and then calibrate your heart accordingly. That's what's going on in the passage today. Number one, no opposition. No opposition. This point is a bit mislabeled, isn't it? Because Paul's point in verse 31 is not that the, peoples, the people of God do not have enemies or opponents. No, actually, he assumes the presence of opponents all throughout this passage. I mean, just look at verse 35. Among the things that threaten us as believers are things like persecution, danger, and the sword, death. Prince Paul's ministry career was chock full of enemies who opposed him. So his point cannot be that since God is for us, we don't have enemies. His point is that since God is for us, our enemies cannot ultimately succeed against us. No opponent can finally crush us in the end. Why? Because God is our sovereign protector who has eternally committed himself to his people. In other words, through Christ, God is on our side. So friends, when Paul says, if God is for us, It really has the sense of since God is for us. There is zero speculation here, right? Paul's point is not if God is for us and let's hope to God that he's for us, right? No, it is if God is for us and he a thousand percent is for us, who could possibly stand against us? And this verse recalls the words of King David in Psalm 56, 9. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is for you as a Christian? The point is that when the almighty creator and ruler of heaven and earth has committed himself to you in love, when he's on your side, friends, you literally have nothing to fear. Beloved, there are times when the entire universe might seem to be marshaled against God's people, when Satan and the forces of darkness are attacking and are doing their worst, when those around you criticize you and oppose you for your love for Christ. But friends, what we need to get clear on our minds is that none of it in the end can finally touch the people of God. Friends, hell's worst can never prevail over us because heaven's king has taken up our cause. Friends, let me ask you, what is the worst our enemies can do to us? What's the worst? Kill us? I mean, is that it? Because we sang this morning, just a few minutes ago, death was once my great opponent. Implying what? It no longer is. It once was No longer. For the Christian, death is dead and Christ has risen. 
So friends, we can say to those who oppose us, do your worst. Even if you kill me, you're simply rolling out the red carpet for my entrance into eternal life with our God. So I was studying this verse this week, that scene from Disney's The Lion King came to mind where Simba and Nala, the lion cubs, the young lion cubs had wandered from their pride into the elephant graveyard. Remember that? And what happened in the elephant graveyard? Well, Scar had told the hyenas that that's where they'd find the young cubs. And so the three hyenas were attacking Simba and Nala and were closing in around them. And of course, you remember when Simba was backed into the corner, he lets out his best roar to try to scare the hyenas off. But because it was so puny, they just laughed at him and said, is that all you got? Right? And so Simba, again, tries to let out a roar, but this time his puny roar was overwhelmed by the deep, ferocious roar of his father, King Mufasa, who had arrived to save and defend his son. Beloved, left to ourself and our own resources, we have no confidence to face whatever opposition comes our way. We have every reason to cower in fear. But praise be to God, we are not left to ourselves. Verse 31 tells us that the king of heaven and earth roars to defend us and protect us. He will have the last word and he will bring us safely home. So friends, let this news settle your heart this morning. This is not a promise, friends, for the Christian elite or for the super holy believers. No, this is a promise for every single child of God, especially those struggling with doubts and fears. Because I hope you'll let... This word caused you to be bold as you live for Christ in this age, as you share the gospel with your unbelieving friends and neighbors and coworkers and family. You don't need to tremble about their, what their response might be. But God is for you. Perhaps you wonder, yeah, but can we really be sure? Can we really be sure that God is for us in this way? Well, Paul answers that question in verse 32. Verse 32, point number two, no deprivation. Look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Friends, do you see the connection between the point of verse 31 and verse 32? How can we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is for us? Answer, he didn't even withhold his own son from us. So now he won't fail to, with his son, give us all things by his grace. Paul's logic moves from the greater to the lesser. Greater. If God has already given us the costliest gift in all the universe, the gift of his beloved son who died for us, then how in the world lesser could he ever fail to give us what is far less costly, everything that we need? The answer, of course, is he can't, and he won't. Now, friends, this verse only makes sense if we see Jesus' death upon the cross as part of God's initiative and part of his plan. Okay, do you see that? Because what does the verse say? That the Father gave him up for us. Yes, the Jews rejected Christ. Yes, Judas sold him out. Yes, Pilate decided that he should be crucified. But friends, at the end of the day, no human being was the ultimate cause of Jesus' death upon the cross. It was the Father, as verse 32 says, who gave him up for us all, us all being all God's people who believe in Christ. So John 3.16 reminds us of the same truth, the most famous verse in all the Bible. God loved the world in this way that he what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Friends, the father gave up his son to a brutal, agonizing, bloody death to bear the wrath of God for our sin, to accomplish our salvation, to purchase our redemption. The 19th century British pastor Octavius Winslow put it this way, Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy. But the Father for love. 
the reason that no enemy can ever successfully oppose us is, friends, that our God refused to deprive us of his dear son. And now the cross is the ongoing guarantee of God's continuing, unfailing generosity toward us as his people. So people have asked, well, what what in the world does Paul mean when he writes that God will graciously give us all things? What are these all things? Well, friends, think about it. Paul just wrote just a few verses prior that we as the children of God are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ of an eternal inheritance and a new creation with a resurrected and glorified body. All things are going to be ours to enjoy in the new world. Did you know that? Paul just wrote in verse 28 that all things work together in this life for our eternal good. So when Paul writes that because God did not spare his beloved son, he won't fail to give us all things, guess what he means? He means that he won't fail to give us all things. He won't withhold anything from you in this life or the next that would contribute, friend, to your eternal joy if you're in Christ. Now, listen, you and I may struggle to grasp how that's the case. There are certainly times in our earthly experience where when we feel like we're being deprived, right? Maybe a dream crumbled. Maybe your prayer remains unanswered that you've been praying for years. Maybe your finances are tight. If you're, God's depriving me. I love the cross tells us a different story. It assures us that God's generosity cannot be withheld from his people. Now in Christ, everything, friends, everything he sends our way is a gift aimed at our ultimate good. Otherwise, friend, he simply would not send it. Imagine a billionaire who buys himself a Bentley or a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, whatever your you know, luxury car of choice is that you can't afford, right? Imagine more power to you if you could, if you can. Imagine a billionaire who buys himself a Bentley, but then he abandons it on the roadside. And you approach this wealthy man and you say, well, why in the world did you leave your new luxury car just sitting there on the side of the road, man? And the billionaire looks at you and says, well, so, you know, the gas was just too expensive. Now, friends, I know gas is expensive these days, but if someone can afford the Bentley, guess what? He can afford the gas. It would be absurd to think otherwise. How much more absurd is it to think that the same God who purchased our eternal redemption with the costly death of his son would now abandon us on the roadside in our moment of need? It is simply an, imp- an impossibility. Friends, if the takeaway of verse 31 is don't be afraid, the takeaway of verse 32 is don't worry. Don't Worry, don't be anxious, dear brothers and sisters. Every good thing in this life and in the next is yours because the Father did not spare his own son but gave him up for you. Number three, no condemnation. No condemnation. The questions within verses 33 and 34, well, they actually essentially ask the same question, okay? In these verses, it's like Paul takes us up to heaven's courtroom to remind us what the verdict over our lives is as believers. Look at verse 33. Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Okay, again, just like in verse 33, 31, Paul's point is not that no one can bring an accusing charge against us. I mean, goodness gracious, there are so many voices that could be raised against us to bring a charge to accuse us. Friends, maybe there are are non-Christians in your life who are unjustly accusing you or criticizing you because you're a Christian. Well, this passage, this verse reminds you that God is your defender. But I actually think that Paul has a very specific type of application in mind here. The one who kind of, that kind of flies across heaven's courtroom against us. A type of charge that if prosecuted would condemn us eternally. 
as eternally guilty before God. Friends, did you know that Satan is called the accuser of the brothers? He's a liar. He's a slanderer. He accuses God's people before God. Read the story of Job. Remember that? That's what he did with Job. Read it, Zechariah 3, where Satan stands in the presence of God and accuses Joshua, the high priest. And it's not like the, the charges that Satan brings against us to God are made up, right? Not all the time. Accusations are only threatening if they're what? If they're true. Accusations are only threatening if they're true. And Satan has plenty of evidence from, from our lives, what we've done to levy accurate accusations against us before God. Indictments that would damn us if convicted. But that's not all. Satan doesn't just accuse us before God. He accuses us to, himself, to ourselves. He plagues our own consciences about the wrongs we've done so that we wind up accusing and condemning ourselves and our own thoughts. How could I commit that same sin again? I did it again. I do not belong to God. I can't. How could I struggle with this doubt or that area of unbelief? Nobody around me seems to be struggling with that. Surely God does not want me around him. Friend, listen to the, the words of verse 33. Who can bring any charge against God, God's elect? The implied answer, again, is no one. Why? Because we're sinless? Because we've cleaned up our act just enough to sidestep the accusation? No, friend, the reason that no charge can stick against us and render a guilty verdict is because God, through Christ, has already rendered another verdict over our lives. You see that? Paul says, in response, it is God who justifies. Friends, this word justifies doesn't merely mean that God has exonerated the elect in his heavenly court. It's not simply that he's declared his people innocent. It's actually much, much more than that. It's better. Paul is reminding us that if you're trusting in Christ alone to save you from the penalty of your sin, God has declared you righteous. It's not merely that your track record of wrong has been expunged and wiped away. It's that a new track record of right has been credited to you. Say, John, can you prove it? Can you prove that? Like, is there any hard evidence in the heavenly courtroom that proves the case that God's people are justified and that no charge, no matter how accurate it is, can be held against us before the Lord? Well, friends, check out verse 34. It's like Paul says, look here, look here, brother or sister, wrestling with, with guilt, wrestling with shame, wrestling with doubts, wrestling with unbelief. Here's the proof that God justifies the elect. That he's declared all who have trusted in Jesus to save, to be righteous. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Paul says, let me present to you exhibit A. Christ Jesus is the one who died. Beloved, this is the, the logic of the cross that Paul has been pressing home time and time again throughout Romans. He's saying, listen, on the cross, Christ Jesus became our substitute in judgment. He took the just punishment that we deserve for our sin and rebellion against God. This so much is assumed in this statement, Christ Jesus is the one who died. On the cross, Jesus was counted guilty with our sin, our unrighteousness. Do you know, friend, that God dealt with Christ on the cross as if he were the wicked sinner? God pardons our sin because Jesus paid the price for them. And now, through faith in Christ, his perfect track record, Jesus' perfect track record of righteousness is counted to us so that now God deals with us through Christ, not as if we're the wicked sinner but as if we're the righteous saint, because that's what he's declared us to be. Ex exhibit A is that Jesus paid sin's eternal price for all who trust him. I say, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but did Jesus really do that? Like, really, you know? Did God really accept that sacrifice? Paul says, well, may I present to you exhibit B. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, 
who was raised. The proof of receipt that sin's price has been paid is that the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ is empty. You see, friends, the consistent message of the scripture is that the wage of sin is what? It's death. What we deserve for our sin against God is physical death and spiritual, eternal death, a separation from him for all eternity. And so you understand then, friends, if Jesus had remained in the tomb, if his body rotted in the earth like the rest of humanity, it would have proved that he was not anything special, that he really was full of sin, just like the rest of us, that he wasn't qualified to save us from anything. But because our Lord never once sinned in thought, word, or deed, the grave could not hold him. A father justified his son on the third day. He vindicated his innocence so that now, because we are vitally connected to Jesus by faith, we too are justified. As Paul already wrote about this earlier in Romans 4.25, we looked at it last year together. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification, Paul wrote earlier. That's why we celebrate Easter. There simply is no eternal salvation, no forgiveness of sins if Jesus had not risen from the dead. That's not all. Paul has more evidence. He says, here's exhibit C. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. He was at the right hand of God. Friends, this right hand of God language speaks of Jesus' exaltation, of his enthronement as king of the universe. The direct fulfillment of Psalm 110, which foretells of the Messiah's future enthronement at the right hand of God. And yet we really can't understand Exhibit C without its direct link to Exhibit D. So look at the text again. Exhibit D, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Beloved, the reason that we as believers can be so brazenly confident that no accusation will condemn us before God is because Christ Jesus, having paid the full price for our sin, is now forever in the presence of God. And guess what he's doing? He's advocating on our behalf. He's interceding for us. It's like Jesus, as our high priest, functions kind of like our defense attorney. He pleads our case. And yet he pleads our case while also serving as the hard evidence before God of why we are justified. It's like he constantly is in heaven pushing refresh to apply the, his cross work and his resurrection to our account. Brothers and sisters, you understand what this means, right? When you and I sin against God, when we fail miserably, when, when, for instance, we attach ourselves to the sins of the old man that we struggled with before we came to faith, it is not as if Jesus the Christ intercedes for us before the Father with something like this. Well, you know, Father, it's been a, a couple hard weeks for Phil. Like, please don't condemn him. He's had a lot going on in his life. Ah, Beth's messed up again. She didn't get much sleep last night. Father, just go easy on her today. Good grief. Jason's done it again. But he's trying really hard, Lord, so don't judge him. That is not how Jesus' intercession works. Instead, when the accusations fly across the courtroom of heaven, Jesus, our advocate, prays something like this. Oh, Father, yes, I know John blew it again. That's true. The Father is mine. I paid the full price for his sins. I took his condemnation on the cross. And now I'm standing in John's place as the risen and exalted king before you. Yes, John's a sinner, but he still deserves to be here in your presence because I forever have won the right to be in your presence. He's my brother. He's your child. And do you see how this truth revolutionizes our response to sin? <laughs> the truth that Jesus is our interceder, that he's our advocate, should make you a bold repenter. Yes. 
You don't have to hide in the shadows of shame. You don't have to sugarcoat your sin when you're lovingly confronted by a fellow brother or sister who who tries to speak the truth and love to you. You don't have to retreat into a turtle shell of self-protection. Why? Because the worst thing that could ever be spoken about you has already been spoken at the cross. God justified you, precious brother or sister, with his eyes wide open, so to speak. He knew the worst about you at the time when he accepted you for Jesus' sake. You understand that, right? Your sin is so bad. My sin is so bad that Jesus, the Holy One, had to give his life for us. And yet now, through faith in him, God in his mercy has declared you righteous. The verdict God has spoken over your life can never be appealed and it can never be overturned. It is final forever. For those here this morning struggling with the assurance of salvation, for those whose consciences are just constantly plagued with doubts and fears, friends, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Based on this hard evidence of Romans 8.34, who is the one for whom there is no condemnation? Is it the Christian beset by doubts and fears, but who by faith still clings to Jesus? Or is it the Christian who's firm in faith, whose faith in Christ never wavers as it seems? Which one is justified? Trick question. Clearly the answer is both. Because at the end of the day, the grounds for your assurance before God has nothing to do with the quality of your faith. It has nothing to do with the quantity of your faith. It has everything, friend, to do with the object of your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, what silences the accuser is not how sufficient your faith is, but how sufficient Jesus' blood and righteousness are. The remedy for a doubt-plagued soul is not to look inward. It is to look upward. We sang it last week. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. There is no condemnation. Number four, there's no separation. Because this is where the logic of the gospel takes us. Because of the eternal purpose of God that is worked out through the death and resurrection and exaltation and intercession of Jesus Christ for his people, there is nothing that can rip us away from Christ's love. Look again at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It's like Paul ticks off a laundry list of situations that threaten the confidence of believers. You know, in verses 31 to 34, Paul addresses external threats. And here he names external threats, but really I think he's addressing the internal threat that's readily in our own hearts and minds. Because these circumstances of suffering are what causes us to doubt God's love for us, aren't they? Right? We suffer some sort of trial or some sort of affliction, some sort of suffering. We think to ourselves, well, you know, if God really loved me, if he really cared for me, I wouldn't be experiencing this bit of affliction or persecution or threat or whatever. But Paul says, hey, no, 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 no. You're thinking about it all wrong. You're thinking about it all wrong. Don't you see? God's people, his children suffer in all types of ways. In fact, before Paul answers the question that he asks in verse 35, he inserts an Old Testament scripture to prove just how much God's people suffer. In verse 36, he quotes Psalm 44, 22, which is a lament of someone who loves the Lord and yet is subject to horrific suffering. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Quick side note. You have a friend who has bought into the prosperity heresy 
Ask them to make sense of that verse. If it's true that the more faith we have, the less suffering we have, well, what does that verse mean? Side note over, okay? Paul then answers his question from verse 35 in verse 37. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution and so on separate us from the love of Christ? No way. On the contrary, Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul literally, friends, invented a new Greek word when he wrote this verse in the original language. You could literally translate it, in all these things, we are super conquerors through him who loved us. Superhero conquerors. It's not just that God enables us to bear through our sufferings, we have a grit and bear it, get through it. It's that we turn out to be victors over the very things that threaten to rip us away from the love of Christ. If the all things that work together for our eternal good, according to Romans 8, 28, if those all things include my deepest suffering, and it does, then in the end, it's like I stand over those very sufferings as a super conqueror through Christ. It's like a blowout win in March Madness. It is not even close. Paul reaches his climax in verse 37. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, this verse is so beautiful, isn't it? Paul chooses 10 items that on their own would seem powerful enough to detach us from Christ. Just look at them real quick. Death nor life refers to the crisis of death and the calamities of life. Yet no state of being, death or life, no state of being is strong enough to tear us away from Jesus. He is the one who defeated death, who is in fact the Lord of life. Angels and rulers and powers refer to the angelic and demonic realms of the, the cosmic spiritual forces that are, quite frankly, far more powerful than you and I are. Things present or things to come, height nor depth, all these indicate any circumstances that take place in time and space. The worst things that could possibly happen in human history. And finally, just to make sure that he's not left anything out, Paul grabs a phrase that is as comprehensive as possible, nor anything in all creation. It's like literally nothing in the universe that can threaten your standing in the love of God. Why? Because he calls this love of God, the love of God in Christ. It's God's love in and through his son. So in other words, friends, listen. For the Father to remove his love for you, he would literally have to remove his love for his Son and stop answering the Son's prayers. For God to kick you out of his family means that he would have to unexalt his Son from his right hand. For the Father to revoke your eternal life means that he would have to put his Son back in the tomb forever. For the Father to unforgive your sin would mean that he would have to reverse the it is finished of Calvary. In other words, dear brother and sister, it simply cannot happen. God's eternal purpose to save you is not threatened by anything in the universe or any doubt in your own heart. Oh, sure, the implication here is not simply that we make a confession of faith once upon a time and then live however we want and trust that we'll be there in the end, that God's love endures for us. No, clearly the, the pres preserving, persevering love of God is expressed through our persevering faith and clinging to him in our times of doubt, our times of struggle. But friends, our confidence at the end of the day, our confidence is not in our love for God, which is frail and fickle. Our confidence is in his love for us, which is faithful and forever. And if you're here today and you are not a Christian, 
That is, you're not trusting in Jesus alone for your eternal salvation. You're not following Jesus as the king of your life. Not a Christian. First of all, I just want to thank you for being here today on Easter Sunday, for coming today with your friend or family, for sitting through a sermon uh, about a text that's clearly addressed to comfort the hearts of believers in Jesus. But friends, I pray that as you listen to this passage about the security and safety that we Christians have in the love of God, that your heart began to long for that type of love too. Actually, I think you already do. Everyone wants to be loved. And yet every single type of human love will let you down. Whether it's the love that you receive from others or the love you try to give yourself, no one can love you perfectly. That is, except our God. And the worst thing you could do is to hear the promises of Romans 8, 31 to 39 about God being for his people and just kind of flippantly think that you share in that promise, that God is naturally for you, that he's naturally predisposed toward you. So many people I interact with think that. Yeah, me and God are cool. You ever heard someone say that? Me and God are cool. We're, we've always been tight. I pray. No, actually, friend, nobody is born into the type of relationship with God or comes to it on their own. The scripture tells us that we have all turned away from God. Instead of giving the Lord the worship he deserves, we have turned away to worship lesser things, including ourselves. The relationship between God and man has been severed because of our sin. Left to ourselves, friend, God is not for us. He is against us. Friends, that is really, really bad news because the converse of verse 31 is true as well. If God is against you, who could be for you? There is no one to help you in the end if God opposes you. What each of us deserves is not merely God's opposition to us in this life, but his opposition to us in eternity. Our Lord would be perfectly right and just to condemn each and every one of us to an eternal existence apart from him, the source of all that is good. But friends, this hard news, this difficult news that I've just laid out for you is why Easter exists. It's why someone may have invited you to church this morning. Because this bad news of our sin and judgment is the reason that God has delivered the best news imaginable. He did not leave us in our sins. He sent his son, Jesus, fully God and fully man, to live upon this earth the righteous life that we should have lived and to die the eternal death that we deserve in our sin. On the cross, Jesus bore the eternal judgment of all who would turn from their sin and trust in him. Jesus took our place. And on the third day, he rose in triumph over the grave, proving that God accepted his sacrifice. The theologian John Stott put it like this, just one of the most beautiful quotes you ever hear about our Savior. The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Christ Jesus died for us. Romans 8 is not good news for the morally elite. It's good news for the morally bankrupt who recognize their great need, turn from the rebellion against God, and receive from God's hand all that Christ Jesus has won. Friends, you can't work for that. You can't earn that salvation. You can only receive it by faith. It really is as simple as that. But friend, in this very moment, if your heart will pivot to embrace Jesus, God's son, and bow to him as your Lord, friend, you can be sure. You can be confident that even in this very moment, our God is for you just as much as he is for his son, Christ. I pray you'll come to him today. Let's pray.
Oh, Father, may these five promises, these four to five promises that we have looked at this morning, that there is no opposition, no deprivation, no accusation, no condemnation, no separation. Oh, Father, may these truths fill our heart with joy. May they cause us to lift up our eyes from our struggles and set them upon you to see how adequate you are to meet our need both now and forever. Oh, Lord, I pray that you might just cause the people of Redeeming Grace Church to grow in trust and love for you in the midst of the cares of this life. Oh, Lord, may we encourage one another with these gospel realities that we've studied together in Romans 8. And Lord, I pray for those who are here this morning who are not believers, who have not yet turned from their sin to faith in Jesus. Oh, Lord, be at work in their life. Help them them to know that this is a, a church that loves them, that they always have an open door here, that we want them here to be sitting under the sound of your word and the gospel. I pray that many conversations would happen even this afternoon over lunch or uh, fellowship or hanging out or whatever that would lead toward a better understanding of what Christ has done for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.